On a cold February morning in the 2000s, the Californian skies have been cleared for a very special flight. A giant machine with 12 supersonic turbojets rolls out onto the desert runway. The crew double check its urgent cargo is secure, components for a 70,000 ton solar power plant, destined to skim the atmosphere in low orbit above the Earth. For this colossal monster, this mission would be the first of many flights this year. One of 25 years of operations planned to build a ring of 60 orbital power stations to solve the US energy crisis. At 8.36, President El Gore has approved the flight and the tower has authorized takeoff. The captain gives the command, go with throttle up, and the Rockwell International Star Raker takes to the sky. But this alternative history never happened. Breaking the sound barrier at Mach 6, this 12-engine turbojet space plane would have ushered in a new age of space exploration and made even the most impressive SpaceX rocket obsolete. But the legendary star plane would never be built, and today its successor, the Space Shuttle, is no more. What was the Star Raker? How did it fly? And why did America decide to never build it? Grab your oxygen and let's jump into low Earth orbit. In the 1970s, America faced increasingly worse energy shortages. And when the demand grows greater than the immediate supply, the circuits break. Its main source of petroleum had ground to a halt thanks to international crises in Iran and the Middle East, and nuclear had been ruled out after two high-profile nuclear meltdowns. There's no shortage. I don't believe there's a shortage. By 1977, the threat of running out of energy had gripped the nation, with President Carter declaring, Then we must start now to develop the new, unconventional sources of energy that we will rely on in the next century. And boy, would they come up with something that would tick the unconventional box. NASA pitched a series of 60 gigantic geosynchronous satellites orbiting the planet, beaming down refined energy for the world's use. It was called the Satellite Power System and would be comprised of a global network of giant photovoltaic arrays. And boy, they were huge. With two long solar panel structures 5 kilometers long by 4 kilometers wide, or 3.1 miles by 2.4 miles, for a total of 11.73 kilometers long, or 7.2 miles in imperial units, weighing the small amount of 10.42 million kilograms, or 22.97 million pounds. Now you're thinking, Nick, that doesn't make any sense. How can we imagine the size of these satellites in a more realistic way? Well, here's an excellent graphic from Scott from Aerospace Projects Review that shows off the solar power satellite over New York. It's bigger than Manhattan and easily crushes part of the outer boroughs as well. And you can see more detail about this on his website down below, which, as I always do, I strongly recommend. By being in orbit, weather, dust and day and night cycles would be eliminated, allowing the power station to produce energy 24-7. The electricity generated would be sent down via microwaves to a thin receiving mesh that could be built pretty much anywhere, even over oceans. This project would take 30 years to realize all 60 units, but it would spawn an incredibly lucrative industry planet side in the United States. The SPS is an attractive, challenging and worthy project, which the aerospace community is well prepared and able to address, physicist Robert G. Jahn wrote in support of the project. But the problem was, how would NASA even get all of the materials, personnel, solar panels and more into orbit to build these power stations. So far they had only launched the 77 metric ton or 85 US ton Skylab into low Earth orbit using a huge Saturn V rockets left over from the earlier Apollo moon missions. 
The new solar power plants weighed a hundred times more than even the modern International Space Station that we have orbiting us today, and rockets wouldn't cut it. It would need over a thousand Saturn V launches to even get one SPS into orbit, let alone 60. So NASA turned to the market for the solution, and the first to reply was Boeing. Boeing had a variety of different ideas, but the key one that they provided was called the Space Freighter. The Space Freighter was Boeing's pitch to solve the Earth to orbit problem of the SBS program. As its name may infer, it was actually a rocket system slash space plane that would act like a lorry for space station components for assembly in orbit, and it would work like this. The rocket would be comprised of two stages, the booster and the orbiter. It would sit on the launch pad and launch to the east. Once the propellant was expended in its main fuel tank, it would jettison the booster and the second stage, aptly named the orbiter, would continue to orbit, which I think is really self-explanatory. Once the orbiter had reached its destination, it would rendezvous with the station scaffold, dock and unload its materials. Each mission would have a payload of 424,000 kilograms or 934,000 pounds. The space freighter would then use the remaining fuel to deorbit and return to Earth, landing via a runway, much like the shuttle. The booster section that had separated earlier would have also done the same, using onboard jet engines to become more plane-like and land on a very wide runway approximately 200 miles away from the launch pad. When the booster and the orbiter were reunited back at the launch site, they would have been reassembled and new cargo loaded for another flight. And just pausing this for a second because this back at the launch site is a detail that many sources kind of glossed over, but it's actually far more complex. You see, the booster would land approximately 200 miles downrange of the launch site. This would mean that if it took off from Cape Canaveral in Florida, it would actually land in the sea. Thus, engineers decided that this space freighter would need to leave from either Nevada or Arizona, landing in a successive state to the west, such as New Mexico or Texas. Then the booster would be put on a train and sent back to the launch site. So not only would the rocket need to be built, but a new airport 200 miles downrange and a railway line connecting them both making the project very expensive. For the goal of two SPSs built per year, the system would require a stunning 240 space launches a year, or a turnaround every 36 hours. With a fleet of 94 space freighters, they expected to have each one flying every five days, reaching the retirement milestone quickly in only four years. This was actually only one of many other SPS launch vehicles proposed in the era, and it deserves its own video in greater detail. So give this video a like if you'd like to see more other wacky plans that were proposed just like this one. Speaking of the plans, commenting on them later in 1981, NASA made the very interesting observation. The magnitude and sustained nature of this advanced space transportation program concept requires long-term routine operations somewhat analogous to commercial airline and air freight operations. And it's those last words that are very telling. What if this system really did have more in common with air freight operations than rockets? Like the Star Raker. Overlooking the ideas in the late 70s for a space freighter, Rockwell International realized there were several areas that could be substantially improved. They came up with this, the air breather rocket powered horizontal takeoff Tri-Delta Flying Wing Single Stage to Orbit Transportation System, or dubbed today as the Rockwell International Star Raker. It was a space plane that was 103 meters long with a wingspan of 93 meters and would have carried a maximum of 89.2 metric tons of cargo into low Earth orbit around 300 nautical miles above the equator, or 555 kilometers. 
Overall, this would have allowed firms to get payloads into orbit for a cost of around $15 per pound, which is $55 per pound today. In metric, this is 25 US dollars per kilogram. For comparison's sake, Elon Musk with the SpaceX rockets costs around about $2,720 per kilogram to put something into orbit. So clearly this dream of low cost orbit delivery is totally ridiculous and would be a total game changer. Thanks to this vast tri-delta wing blended design, there was a great deal of eternal volume, not only for cargo but fuel as well. The cargo deck was modelled after the C-5 Galaxy and it was 20 feet high and 20 feet wide in a square shape and 141 feet long. That's 6x6 six six and 42.9 metres for those living outside the USA. The craft would have two engine systems. The first was a conventional jet engine, specifically a hydrogen fueled high bypass supersonic turbofan air turbo exchanger ramjet engine, each with 140,000 pounds of thrust. The space plane also had three hydrogen fueled rocket engines, each with 1.06 million pounds of thrust and an ISP of 455 seconds enough to get it into that high orbit. And this is how it would all come together. The Star Raker would start its mission with a conventional runway takeoff with conventional turbofan power. Its ramjets would also act as supercharged afterburners to help it get into the air. It would then jettison its landing gear that would land softly via parachutes and be used for the next mission. It would then head to the equator from Florida, flying much like a normal plane. This would burn up fuel and mean less for the trip into orbit, but Rockwell International countered that future versions would have in-flight refueling. And this is where it gets crazy. The aircraft would then rise to an altitude of 45,000 feet before diving directly down to 37,000 feet to build up speed and break the sound barrier. Then it would angle upwards to reach 95,000 feet or 29 kilometers before activating its rocket engines, hitting speeds up to Mach 7.2. It would then shut down the air breather engines while closing air breather inlet ramps. Once it reached the high enough orbit point, it would then shut down rocket engines and execute a ho man transfer to 556 kilometers above the Earth, or that sweet 300 nautical mile orbit. With the aircraft, or should I say spacecraft now, in orbit, it would open its nose to release the payload directly, or if meeting the vast space station scaffold building the solar power plant, dock. It would have a system of rails on board that could quickly mate with the rails of the space station and funnel out cargo. The nose that would actually swing out would have a two-level crew compartment, with a flight deck and seating on the upper level, then electronics, life support and emergency supplies on the lower deck. There wasn't really any sleeping quarters as the missions were not expected to take very long, as opposed to the Boeing space freighter that would be over 24 hours. There was also an airlock on the back of the section to allow access to the cargo bay, either in flight or once it got up to space. Leaving orbit would be fairly typical of the same flight path of the shuttle that we have today. The Star Raker would perform a low gamma flight path angle and high alpha angle of attack re-entry deacceleration profile at approximately Mach 6. Then reduce alpha angle of attack to appropriate angle for maximum lift drag ratio for a high speed glide and cross range maneuvers to subsonic velocity, which is about what a plane flies at at Mach 0.85. It would then open its inlets and start some of the air breather engines and then perform a powered flight to a landing field, land on a runway, and taxi to the ramp. The Star Raker would have enough fuel for a 300 nautical mile subsonic cruise, or 555 kilometers, as well as two landing attempts, just in case the first one wasn't successful. In terms of the SPS program we outlined before, they would need 1,100 flights 
each year to support the SPS program, or about one launch of the Star Raker every eight hours from a fleet of 30 aircraft, which is pretty insane. The Star Raker had several advantages over the space freighter, including the ability to land at any airport that could hold a 747 or C5 Galaxy. It only needed a runway of about 8,000 to 14,000 feet long, 2,440 meters to 4,270 meters for landing and takeoff respectively. This would mean that it could pick up cargo by itself at some regional airport before heading to the space launch site. No special intermodal transport needed. Industry experts express that the Star Raker represents the direct thrust of future aerospace development. It is necessary that the essential technologies be pursued actively, yet the world would never see further development. Why was this miracle machine never built? In the end, the Star Raker never really came close to development. It was a change in political power in the United States to the Reagan administration and the price of oil plummeting that made this expensive energy concept, the ring of SPS satellites, seem very foolish and very expensive. Without a need for a launch craft, the whole concept unraveled. Work did continue on other projects at Rockwell International, but that's a video for another day. There also were some issues with the Star Raker design. For one, it could carry less than other SPS launch systems and relied on future materials technology that wasn't really possible back then. As cool as a single stage to orbit plane is, even today there hasn't been a successful space plane design, with us only coming close with rockets launched from flying aircraft. So it's ambiguous if even the concept itself would work. Another flaw with the Star Raker design was the fuel. The Star Raker was supposed to be powered by liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. Two things you don't really find lying around at many airports, if any, across the United States. Tons of infrastructure would need to be built to support the refueling of these giant space planes, but engineers proposed that the creation of this lucrative industry would come with its own supportive infrastructure. Build it and they will come, so to speak. And in addition, as of an insult to injury, the actual space plane had a geometrically complex multi-cell fuel tank, a series of conventional cylinders that were put together side by side to make a boxy fuel tank. They were held together by a web of internal tension to keep them together whilst in flight. This concept would have meant greater volume and be incredibly lightweight, but such a fuel tank had never been built and there were many questions if it was even possible to design such a thing. Flash forward to the year 2021 and we can't help but think that such a mission for an alternative fuel source would have been very useful in the age of global warming and the climate emergency. If we had near infinite power in orbit around the planet, it would have been incredible for transporting energy around the world and made fossil fuels obsolete overnight. It is possible that America would have shared the SPS power network with its allies around the world if not the rest of the world, to prevent further climate calamities. Although perhaps that idea is a little bit utopian, and it's more than likely they would have just turned the satellites into some sort of orbital microwave cannon. The Rockwell International Star Raker would have been the ideal craft for many other missions, and a fleet of them being available for various tasks at a moment's notice is eye-watering for this space fan. Imagine the other orbital stations we could have built, the use for deep space mining, or even a passenger version to take us to the stars. For all the never-built concepts that I have covered on this channel, this one hurts the most and makes me the saddest of them all. Thanks so much for watching today's video on the Star Raker. It was an incredible invention and something that we can all agree should have been built. 
Again, as I mentioned, there was plenty more plans for various other SPS launches from many other developers and two more from Rockwell International as well. I could have made an hour long documentary on the whole program, so leave a like down below if you think I should go into way more detail on these other programs and release something that would take me six months to make. A very special thank you again from Scott from Aerospace Projects Review, who helped with the final points of detail with this concept. While it's been widely published, there was plenty of missing pages from the Star Wrecker concept. An Aerospace Projects Review provided the nitty gritty detail that we love so much. So definitely click on their link down below and go check them out. Lastly, a very special thank you to my Patreons that have supported this channel so far and have been incredible for everything from ideas to helping me realize my dream. Thank you so much for watching.